I think we're ready. So, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Monica, and uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about the tech behind a design system that scales. So, just to introduce myself, um, as Nick already said, I'm coming here from Berlin, um, and I'm the lead front end engineer at SumUp. Uh, a company also based in Berlin, a fintech company, and uh, I'm going to share a little bit of context about why scalability is important for us and also uh, talk about why that connected to starting to build our own design system and the tech choices that we made. So where we're going tonight, uh, first things first, I'm going to talk about a use case. So a story that might sound familiar to you and might signal to you that a design system is something that could help your team as well. I'm also going to talk about what a design system is, in case you're not familiar, um, and also how design systems, by their own nature, help us to scale. Then I'm going to talk about some specific challenges and how the design system and the tech stack that we chose helped us to ensure it was going to be scalable as we continued with it. Mm -hmm. And last, I'm going to show you a little bit about what we built. So what did all of this technology actually result in? So to give you some context, um, the company I'm working for is called SumUp, and it's been around for about five years now. Uh, so in this time, uh, we've grown from you know, being a really small company to today over 800 people, um, and about half of that is in the last year alone. So you can imagine that as we are building things, we're thinking a lot about how this is going to look in another year, where we could be 1,200 people. Uh, so that should give you a bit of a taste for why a design system came into our thinking. Uh, we're also live in more than 30 markets. So with every single language and country, you get a whole new level of complexity. And the core product is basically um, a device that we create in-house, which allows businesses to accept card payments. They can do this through our app and online. So we have hardware and software that combines to create this experience. Now, with this as a broader context, let me drill down to a specific use case that shows actually how we ran into some problems and how a design system could help us solve them. So once upon a time, I was having a conversation with my coworker, Felix, and he was telling me about a really complicated uh, React component he was building. Um, and the purpose of this component was to accept some amount of money, um, which we want to charge other people, our customers, et cetera. And he said, yeah, it's really complicated. You know, I have a lot of locales to handle, a lot of currencies. Uh, the formatting is, you know, really all over the place, depending where you are, what language you speak. But unfortunately, this came as a surprise to me. I was like, wait a second, why are you even working on this? And he was like, yeah, you know, it's so complex. I've been spending a lot of time with QA to get this out the door. And the problem was that I had actually already built this, this component but he was spending his time basically reinventing something that was already in production, already working, and obviously this is not the most efficient way to continue, right? And yeah, <laughs> it was not so pleasant for him to find out that this was in fact a solved problem. So what happened? So a few months before, I had been working on a, a screen where people could make uh, payments online. And at that point, he was working on refunds. So we were working in two different teams. And the fact is that we just didn't realize that the product was growing so complex um, with so many use cases, features that are not available to all users, that he couldn't have known that my problem was already solved. And the amazing fact is that we were actually sitting right next to each other as this happened. So it's not about not communicating, not seeing each other every day. It's really about that at a certain point, the scale uh, that you're operating at and the size of the application and its complexity just becomes too big for one person to keep the whole thing in their head. So going forward, as I said, we're thinking a lot about how we're going to be scaling. We already know that we have engineering teams in three different countries and time zones. And we know that the engineering team is roughly doubling in size every year. So if we continue like this, how many duplicated currency inputs or other UI components are we going to end up with? And this presented a question to us, OK? How can we scale the team and the product offering as it becomes more complex, more varied, and more featureful, while also increasing the developer efficiency and providing a consistent user experience? 
The answer is that we needed a system. You can imagine what kind of system I'm going to suggest we needed, a design system. Um, and I really like this quote from the Envision blog, which shares uh, a few of the core concepts of a design system. So it should comprise reusable components guided by clear standards that can be assembled together to build any number of applications. So on a higher level, what are the, some of the components that come together to create a design system? On the one hand, you have ideas, so the core principles that are driving your design system, how you want it to feel, the kind of language you want to use to communicate with your end user. And you also have the artifacts, like the implementation of all of those ideas, uh, things like a component library, documentation, the tools you're using, and a process for introducing change. And when you put together the ideas that drive your system and the actual you know, software that you end up creating at the end, you end up with something that can evolve and change together over time because a design system is never finished and you always want to be able to take new ideas and incorporate them in a way that's going to be able to propagate um, through your product. So let's look at some of the ways that by their nature a design system is going to help you scale. So first things first, having a component library helps you to avoid solving solved problems again. So exactly in the case of this currency input, we wouldn't have run into this if we had a central place where these things existed. The next thing is documentation. So as I said, we have a big team and it's distributed and there's always somebody who's at lunch or somebody who's out on holiday or the time zone is different. The more you can allow people to answer their own questions, the more efficient everybody is going to be. And the tools, of course. If you have a single source of truth, whether this is uh, in a sketch file or in your component library, you know that this is the place I can rely on the latest and greatest state of this component. And finally, a process. So some teams are really lucky. They have uh, you know, 12 people working on their design system full time, and that's cool. Uh, but most of us are not in this luxurious position. Uh, we need to take outside contributions and make sure it's going to be efficient, that when someone needs something from the design system, that the team working on it isn't a bottleneck for progress. And that's why the process is so important. So specifically, when it comes to the design system, what are some of the ways that the tech stack that we're using enables us to scale? So first things first, it's about the people, right? And I already said the team is growing and distributed. So thinking about how people will use the design system is going to influence the tech stack. Then it's the products. So we may have one uh, or two core products today, but this number is going to greatly multiply uh, in the coming months. We want to be thinking about the future, the more products we're going to have, while also not leaving out old products or uh, older projects from being able to opt into the design system. And finally, the process. So as we have more and more parallel teams, how can we choose a tech stack that is going to empower those teams to work together? So here are a couple of the technical solutions, um, and I'm going to talk about each of these in more depth. So for people, we optimize the workflow by creating a component library workbench and in-context documentation. We enable products to be built in the future that we don't even know what they're going to be yet, how they're going to look, by thinking about theming and also enabling static CSS extraction so that we can support a diverse tech stack even if the stuff we're working with daily is a bit more modern. And finally, for processes, how we can make it really easy for people to contribute so it's not just uh, one team as the bottleneck where everybody is waiting for them to do everything because they know the process for introducing change. But before I, I mention all of these things, I want to say why we chose React because I think it's really scary when you're implementing a design system to pick a technology uh, because it's really a commitment. And I think a lot of people are worried about coupling their design system to the tech stack. And there are a lot of people that believe you should have just CSS only implementation um, because you shouldn't be too tied. Um, so to illustrate how we came to this decision, I want to share a story. So um, a few months ago, I was trying to explain React to a guy who had been writing jQuery for the last 10 years or so. And uh, he looked at me and he said, Monica, HTML and CSS is like pizza and ice cream. They are good on their own. 
why do you want me to mix them together? And I was like, well, that's a really good point, actually. Maybe, maybe they do belong on their own, right? And this is just making things too complicated. Um, but the reality is that over time, these things got a lot bigger than they intended, right? So we ended up with like huge template files, JavaScript making modifications all sorts of places, um, and you know enough CSS that if you made a small mistake, your whole page could go wrong. And the key problem here was that we were relying on these global naming schemes, right, to kind of glue everything together. And if you mess this up, there was like a really difficult time to debug what was happening. So what React brought to the table was that we could actually choose to couple certain types of things together, right? We could take the structure, the behavior, and the design of some UI element and force them kind of to, to be used together. And in the end, this is why we chose React, because we tried a CSS-only solution. It introduced uh, a lot of problems with people using it inconsistently. There was so much room for user error, and we wanted to make sure that the experience was going to be consistent. And this is why we said, OK, we're going to choose React, but we're also going to be thinking about other tools that can't use React. And I'm going to talk later about how we kept ourselves loosely coupled to React, let's say. So, Let's talk about people, and we'll come back to that topic later. So a lot of people here probably are using Storybook by now, but um, I would say this kind of revolutionized the way that we were working on components um, and for a few reasons. So here you have uh, your development environment that's totally isolated from your app. You have a way to browse all the UI components. You have in-context uh, documentation, source code, and test output. And the cool thing about this is that when you're making new UI components in Storybook, you don't have to actually leave your development environment to find out what other components are doing. So you don't need to go scurrying through the source code to find out what your colleague did the other day. It's really clearly documented. And this is more powerful than it seems, I believe. So the first thing is that it provides a productive developer experience. And if you're working on an app that wasn't made just in the last six months, um, but rather the last three years. Um, you might not have the most uh, optimized workflow, um, okay. but at least inside Storybook, you're going to really be able to make this uh, as fast as possible. So for example, using hot reloading. Uh, our app doesn't have this at the moment. We're porting from Angular. So this means that we can develop super fast inside of the Storybook without kind of lugging around the, the process we have in the main application for now. The other aspect is that uh, it keeps our UI components free of application logic, and it keeps them free from being dependent on the application infrastructure. And I think this is the most important part, because when you're developing UI components inside an app, there's a pretty good chance you might accidentally couple things together. And instead of making this component reusable in other applications, it may not even be reusable in the same application, but a different context. And when you develop outside the app, you have absolutely no way to do this to yourself. And finally, it's about discoverability, right? So if you have a component and a developer stumbles upon it because they have this really nice list of what's available to them, they see it's documented, they see that it has tests, they can try it, there's a really good chance that they're not just going to re-implement it for fun, right? And that's what we want to avoid anyways. So. This, I would say, was a really powerful tool for us. And I think the next part where we talk about products is perhaps the most technically challenging um, and also the part that's really allowing us to think about the future in terms of our product. So let's look at how we can uh, enable theming while also uh, keeping in mind our older products and yeah, how we're going to manage that. So what do I mean by theme? So it can be that you have only one product, right? And everything uses the same branding, the same identity, et cetera. Um, we're not in that situation. We have co-branding uh, initiatives. We have other products that are not so related to our main brand. And in this example, you have our website in one country, uh, in the US. And then you have the same website in Chile, where we're co-branded with a bank. We are using a different name. And if you know something about CSS, you know that overriding um, colors Lots of times in lots of places uh, can be a real pain, and it's not that nice to do with SAS either. So for this, we ended up choosing Emotion as a CSS and JS uh, solution, which 
allows us to write our code using um, basically JavaScript objects inside the CSS we're working on. So how does this look? Um, we're able to get uh, a theme object passed down from a theme provider, which is exposed by a context. And this is just basically an object that contains all kinds of information about how we want this component to be customized visually. Um, and as I said, it's just a plain object. There's nothing magical there. Uh, so in fact, it's really straightforward to extend your theme. And you can see that this tag in this case, it doesn't really need to know what country am I in, what theme am I using. It just says whatever theme is active, I'm going to use the color from that. So in the case of our website, it, this makes it really easy. You just say, I use my primary color. And these buttons don't have to be aware, for example, of which theme is active, which is different from what we have today with our SaaS-based solution. And that's really convenient. You can put a lot of information in the theme. But it's kind of ignoring an inconvenient fact, which is that we're not just working in React, right? Most of us who are working on the web, uh, unless you're in a really recent project, it's unlikely that you have like the perfect React tech stack. Uh, and you don't have to touch anything third party, anything legacy that somebody built a few years ago and then left. Uh, so we have a few different uh, pieces of technology that we need to support. And we don't want to leave them out of our design system. Um, this can mean uh, projects built on a different tech stack, for example, with Elm or Jekyll or Riot.js. But it's also third party tools, for example, Salesforce. If we want to be able to keep our design system and our emails we're sending our customers in sync, how are we going to do that if we rely only on a CSS and JS solution? So that's what I'm going to tell you. Um, so here's one example of what makes this more complex. So if you had a simple SaaS solution, you could probably just like feed the variables in, concatenate all of these SaaS files, and at the end, you have some nice CSS-only library. Um, but when you're using CSS and JS, it's more complex, right? You have uh, the different props that are passed into the component that may determine how it looks. And you also have different themes. So if you think about the combinations, you have however many themes you have by any possible combination of parameters. So there become a lot of possibilities quickly that you need to run through. So how did we solve this? Um, we created a node script, which would basically render out all of these components in memory. Um, and every time a component is rendered in emotion, the CSS itself is piped into the emotion cache. So it's just plain CSS, but it's the computed CSS. And what you can do after you've gone through all possible combinations of these components is you can basically like suck out the CSS that you want, stick it in a file, and kind of do some massaging on the names to get something that's actually based on all of your computed code. But you don't have to maintain it separately. You don't have to use SAS. So that's pretty cool. Um, and how you do this, uh, you can use the label feature in Emotion, which will basically append a string to the end of your CSS class names. And this means you can say, I want to have BEM classes, and I want to have a CSS and JS. And this is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. You end up with a scenario where your React apps can use components as they please. And your pure CSS, like your uh, landing pages or whatever you need, um, can simply have BEM style selectors. And these two options are available, and you don't have to maintain two separate solutions. So. What I really love about this is that you end up with a really modern and easy like CSS solution where theming is not a hassle. Um, but you can also style older or third party apps. So you achieve this balance, uh, which I think really makes the design system more robust. And finally, processes. So how did we think about how people who are coming from you know, maybe the outside of this uh, design system, how they can contribute to it and learn about it and be able to use it. So uh, we created some generated documentation using Gatsby. Um, and how we're able to do this is by using the um, documentation annotations inside our components. You can pull this out using a library um, and basically automatically generate documentation. So. Um, this tool also allows you to add readme files so your designers can uh, annotate how they want these components to be used. 
But the important bit is that it all lives together. And as you create components, you can update the documentation right there. And this is pretty great because it means the documentation is less likely to get out of sync. Um, and we also created some uh, handy bash scripts for creating new components. So all of this stuff is automatically in your files when you start working on a new component. And finally, when it comes to regression. So you have a lot of people contributing to the same thing at the same time. If you're not careful, somebody can screw up someone else's code, right? That's why we have tests. Um, and you're probably familiar with snapshot testing, but I will reiterate um, that the core component uh, is that when you run a test, you can save the output to a file, which gets checked into version control. And every time you run this test again, it's checked against uh, whatever was put into this file. And what's neat about this is that when it comes to emotion, you can add a Jest serializer that is going to nicely print out uh, your CSS classes. Um, and if you are relying on static CSS extraction like we are for our third-party apps, it's really important that we are aware of how these computed styles are changing. Because if they break, it's potentially problematic for other apps, right? And you're not directly writing the CSS very much. So it can be intransparent how your changes might affect the computed code. So this is why uh, snapshot testing in this case is a really good usage. Um, and it allows you to also put this into version control if somebody else has a question. How, did you realize that you changed this? Uh, it's really easy to spot. So finally, um, I want to recap wh what we've talked about so far. So we began with a use case uh, talking about uh, this currency input and parallel delivery teams, how they can find out on accident that they are working on the same problem just because you reached a point of complexity that not everyone can keep the whole app in their head at the same time. Then I also shared what a design system is, how you can, how you can think about it, and why design systems are especially suited for teams who are scaling. And finally, what our challenges were when it comes to the growing team, the number of people, um, the fact that we know we're going to be creating more and more projects and products going forward, but that we have still a tech stack from the last five years we need to think about. And finally, how the process can evolve so that people can contribute seamlessly without worrying that they're going to break something. And now I want to show you actually what came of all of this, right? All this thinking about how we could, uh, how we could scale, think about the future. What, what does it actually look like? But just before that, I want to show you what we came from. So it's pretty common that when you start to create a design system that you do what's called a design audit. Um, and this is where you try to find all the dusty corners of your apps. And you try to see, OK, uh, what are all the patterns that are in use right now so that when I create the one button to rule them all, I'm actually handling all of these cases. Um, and this is an example of all the buttons that we found. Um, so you can see they're very creative in some cases. They're very bootstrappy in other cases. Um, some have icons. I mean, what's amazing to me about this is that a designer spent time to think about most of these. A developer spent time to implement all of them. And when you add that all together, it's not really so efficient anymore, right? And this scales up to the application level. So. We have some apps we're actively maintaining. We have some that are there. They work. They don't have a development team currently maintaining them. And they kind of got lost in the redesign process that we did, um, let's say, a year ago or so. And what this really showed was that we couldn't think about redesigning apps anymore. This is just not a scalable solution, because you end up with too many different things to redesign them all individually. So. This is how we came up with the idea to create Circuit, which is the name of our design system that we're working on. Um, the idea behind the name is that just like an electronic circuit, the design system consists of small parts that work together to channel energy into something that's bigger than itself. So what does it look like? Um, we started out with all of our spacings, our colors, uh, headings, typography. Um, we opted for using memory sizes for our names for different things because we had problems with extra, 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 extra large. Uh, so we tried to think how we could avoid that problem. Um, we also created, for example, buttons. Now we have a canonical set of buttons, exactly how they can be. 
Um, they live in one place, and that's where you use them from. And furthermore, they also handle the cases that we discovered in the design audit. So finally, I just want to show you one example of one screen. So this is um, a UI where somebody can accept a payment for uh, a merchant who is not in front of them. So if they get the credit card number read to them on the phone, um, they can input this and make that charge. So what's cool about this is that every single one of the components in this UI is coming from the design system. So this page requires zero custom CSS. You just have to think about how it works. And I don't know about you, uh, but for me, the less CSS I have to write, the better. So uh, this is really awesome, and I've already seen that it makes me more productive because I don't have to think anymore about all of these small things. Uh, someone else already did that, and I can really focus on the behavior and the experience. Finally, is open source um, from the beginning. So you can see all of the raw transformation from early stages to where we are today, which is still a work in progress. Um, but it's quite interesting to look at other people's design systems, how they handled this. We took a lot of inspiration from other systems to create our own. So I hope if you're in this journey at the moment, it's useful for you. And yeah, just want to say thank you. I hope this was helpful somehow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>